I'm Matt at Nexus Baseball, and this is episode two of the Tommy John Epidemic. This series is a YouTube read of content from the book Plague of the Gods, an outsider's perspective on baseball's Tommy John Epidemic, which is available on Amazon. I decided to put this content on YouTube to make the material as accessible as possible. The series examines the science behind the most superhuman action the human body can produce, accelerating a baseball up to 100 miles per hour. I progressed in my training without professional guidance using my athleticism, body awareness, and analytical approach developed over many years of MMA and kinesiology study to meet the challenge. I figured the hip drive was the same as a boxing power punch and combined with my strength would result in success. I started my approach as I had MMA and boxing, examining what the best pitchers and hitters do and trying to determine why. What I found intrigued me. The mechanics of pitchers and hitters that found success varied so wildly in terms of form and presentation that it appeared almost contradictory. Baseball players come in all different shapes and sizes, and all appeared to be doing significantly different things to both use and generate force. This differs greatly from most sports, where there is a consensus on what the right way to execute each technique is, and differences between especially professional techniques are more subtle. I experimented with dozens of stances, loads, and positions to determine what each player was attempting to do. I had believed my athleticism would translate well to baseball, but soon realized that years of striking martial arts and weightlifting had resulted in a significant reduction in the range of motion of my shoulders. This impacted both my ability to swing the bat and more importantly to throw the ball. Although my hips were powerful, my swing appeared more like a cricket swing, and I was throwing every ball like it was a football by getting off to the side of it. The biggest problem I encountered was consistency, particularly with my limited shoulder mobility. I would have one good swing to several poor ones. My throwing and bat speeds would impress no one for someone of my age and athleticism. Undeterred, I continued my training as I had done before, but included more mobility work. 2016 was the year of getting my feet wet and assessing the situation. I experienced several unfortunate setbacks in 2016 that would eventually lead to breakthroughs. These issues were my fault due to training methodology as well as my incessant experimentation, although helpful in gaining new insights, had wreaked havoc with my timing and consistency. Additionally, I found that working from both sides compounded these setbacks, as each side had different mobility levels and didn't progress evenly. Although I had added mobility work in the form of increased static and dynamic stretching, I continued to train how I always had as a boxer in strength training. I liked the familiarity and feeling of the type of strength it provided. This in hindsight significantly hindered the progress of the shoulder mobility work I was doing at the time. I was throwing harder, but due to my incorrect technique and lack of mobility, my right forearm started to tighten up and I began to feel soreness in my elbow. I knew my approach wasn't correct, and shut down my training until I could discover the problem. I redirected my efforts to changing my mobility levels before continuing training. I spent the rest of 2016 and all of 2017 studying tissue and joint mobility, focusing on the facial release te techniques I present in this book. I took a step back and redeveloped my training from a kinesiology first approach, focusing on anatomy. I refused to accept failure and was determined to find the best way to transform my physique specifically for baseball. I also realized that I was in a unique situation, as few if any people of my age attempt to make a transition to baseball. Many take up baseball or softball for fun or to keep in shape, but it occurred to me that most likely no one had ever picked up a ball at age 31 and attempted to throw hard uh, without, an, without ever having thrown the ball with any appreciable ability beforehand. This encouraged me in the same way that a mountain climber would be buoyed attempting to reach the highest peak. Failure was not an option. I started training pitching and hitting again at the beginning of 2018. When watching the standard baseball broadcast angle from center field, you really don't get a sense of the mechanics of a pitcher or hitter. It appears like a flurry of motion and then a result. It is simply too quick for the human eye to see the nuances. Although I had been using slow motion footage off the internet for my kinesiology and anatomy study, most of it was low quality and had poor angles. I made the decision to go down to Florida for spring training in March 2018 to tape pitcher bullpens in high resolution slow motion to get the angles I needed. This I hope would allow me to study the techniques used by the best in greater detail. Everything changed when I was able to see the professionals up close. I could finally see the subtleties I was missing. 
I started to put the final pieces together of not just what the pitchers were doing, but why they were doing it. I spent a year testing my assumptions with my own body, using my left side to beta test new alterations, or refining right, my right side with proven changes. To ensure balance and dexterity, I would alternate each hand, doing daily tasks, right-handed and then left-handed the next day. It struck me that a lot of what I was now seeing and implementing into my own training was not described in the explanations I'd heard from players themselves or from the resources I had read so far. I decided to become an expert on the existing knowledge on pitching and hitting mechanics and read every book, manual, and study on the subject over the course of a year. Sure enough, a lot of the elements I was seeing and applying were not described in the literature. It appears the authors, who were primarily pitchers themselves, were always describing the result of the action and not the action of the body itself. With many contradictory opinions, I decided to trust my anatomical analysis approach and test my own assertions. By March of 2019, when I returned to Florida for spring training, I was now performing at a high level with both arms in pitching and hitting. Most importantly, I was accomplishing both with fluid mechanics and not experiencing any fatigue or arm problems. When, pitching, when watching the pitchers that spring training, I, I could break down exactly what each pitcher and hitter's motion was and why they were making those decisions to swing or hit that way. My study of baseball anatomy particularly informed my understanding. When combined with my body awareness, it allowed me to isolate exactly what the muscles were doing and in what sequence to accomplish the motion. I was able to study an even larger group of pitchers, including some of the game's hardest throwers and greats. I used this new data and research to diagnose why my forearm and elbow had been problematic a couple of years prior, with a more complex, complete picture of the mechanics and the anatomy involved. I decided to write this book after reading The Arm by Jeff Passan of Yahoo Sports as part of my study into pitching mechanics. In this work, Passan analyzed a lot of the current thinking regarding the causes of UCL damage, commonly known as Tommy John surgery. What was most shocking was how little was said old science and how contradictory the data seemed to be. I could not understand how a multi-billion dollar industry with so much available data was seeing an injury explosion and why no one was able to figure out why. I believe these were the missing pieces I had uncovered in my unique baseball journey, and the knowledge that, I, that uh, I found could prevent a lot of the injuries plaguing pitchers at all levels of the game. I spent the next year comparing the existing research to what I had developed, and the result is this book. As an outsider in the baseball world, you might find it challenging to look beyond my, uh, my baseball credentials and address my conclusions. I do encourage readers to come at the work with an open mind. Frequently, it is the outsider perspective that re results in institutional change. We've already seen this several times in the baseball world. In recent years, the game has been inundated by da data analysts and sabermetricians after the work of Bill James, a night security guard at a pork and beans factory, changed the way we view baseball statistics forever. Likewise, technology is continuing to play an ever greater role in the sport, with teams racing to catch up to the information curve. This book is the result of my personal experiences and a tremendous amount of passion and research that I hope will help open new lines of discourse, prevent injuries, help the players of the game we, and help the players of the game we all love. Join me for part three next week. Remember, if you like the content, please like and subscribe. Your support makes this work possible. Also, if you want to jump ahead, please consider picking up the book on Amazon from the link in the description below. See you next week.